It's Sway in the morning. Only on Shea 45. First, let me let me just say this is um I just reached a pinnacle in my career being able to sit down with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And um, you're someone that I grew up in Oakland, California. So, and I grew up in the 70s. So I, I grew up in the mind frame of um, empowerment, you know, uh, faith, uh, resilience, strength, uh, honor, respectability. And um, you have always signified all of those things, all those attributes to us, you know, especially in times coming up in um, Oakland, you know, we face a lot of challenges. You know, sometimes you look for um, inspiration from different places. So I, I can't tell you how many times just by listening to your works or listening to you speak, um, especially even now being, having worked on MTV for 15 years and being in radio for 20 years and uh, being considered um, humbly a voice of this generation or hip hop culture, you know, sometimes you feel challenged and you need those things to kind of strengthen you and I'll look at a speech you made or something you said and, 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 and it's always something I could take away from it that'll keep me smiling and make me feel strong the next day. So I, I always wanted to thank you for that. Thank you very much. Absolutely, absolutely. And I always wanted to know, you know, I always see the minister on the, on the, on the podium, but who is he when he's not on that podium, when he's not on that stage and, and he's not leading the people? And um, in my research, I found out we, you, you, we have a lot in common in the fact that, um, you know, you, you started off as a classically, uh, classical instructed violinist, right? Yes, sir. Uh, how old were you when you first picked up the violin? Five. I didn't pick it up. My mom picked it up uh -huh. and put it in my hand. Uh -huh. She was a domestic worker and very talented seamstress. And she uh, put that violin in my hand, put a clock on the table, and had me practice for 15 minutes and then a half hour, then an hour, and she forced me to do this. Mm. I didn't like playing the violin because they said it was a kind of sissy instrument. <laughs> and who, who wants to look like a sissy? So mm -hmm. I would put a tam on my head like Dizzy Gillespie mm -hmm. and throw my violin up under my arm like it was a horn. <laughs> <laughs> and walk through the black community on my way to my lessons. But after a while, I learned to love it. And when I fell in love with the instrument, mom didn't have to ask me to practice anymore. Mm -hmm. I drove her crazy by playing and practicing four, five, six. Even when I married my dear wife, I would go in a room and tell her, sweetheart, I won't be out for about eight or nine hours. Wow. And it's that discipline that I carried into Islam when I became a Muslim. I just switched the discipline from the study of my instrument to the study of the Word of God. And that's why today, I mean, I don't have to think on what to say uh, or try to make notes and whatnot because so much of it is in me from the discipline of study. So I'm, I'm grateful for the music and I'm back at music You're now. back at music now, right? Yes. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I have to laugh because I thought it was, I was through with it forever because he asked me one day, I wrote a play called Organa, a Negro spelled backwards, because mm -hmm. that's what we were, a people gone backwards. So in this play, I sing, I was a ballad singer, and I sing a, a song that I co-wrote with a brother called Look at My Chains. Mm -hmm. And one day soon you'll hear it again, and I also wrote a song after Brother Malcolm's column 
in the Amsterdam News, Angry Black Man, uh -huh. he wrote a, uh, an article called A White Man's Heaven is a Black Man's Hell. Uh -huh. And that's the way it was 60 years ago. And unfortunately, a white man's heaven is still a black man's hell. And I wrote that song and uh, went into RCA Victor Studios in 1959 uh -huh. and put a soldier in the control room because the words were so hot. I didn't want the man to start messing with the dials. And that song became an underground hit uh -huh. in the 60s. So one day, I, I don't know what caused me to bring my violin out to Chicago. And after dinner, Elijah Muhammad said, uh, uh, you know, pl play me something. So I came to the table where he was sitting and I played and when I finished, he said, boy, you, you really can play that thing. And so a week later, he summoned me to come back with my violin. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to play again. And after I played, I saw this frown on his face. He said, brother, isn't that the same song you played the last time you were here? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. He said, well, don't you know something new? <laughs> so that meant to me after I figured it out, get on back to your instrument. So I went back at it and had played with the symphony orchestra in Chicago and Los Angeles and recorded the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, the Beethoven Violin Concerto. And uh, I made some songs back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. They were on billboard charts, right? Uh, I don't know that they made billboard, but yeah. Some of my Calypso songs, since my mom and my father were from the Caribbean, those songs uh, were on the Calypso hit parade in New York mm -hmm. for about five years. And um, I, I was happy to give all of that up, even though it was the only thing I knew, and it's the thing that I really loved. But since I was a little boy, I've been in love with black people. Mm -hmm. My mother trained me. Her husband, my father, was a follower of Mr. Garvey. My mother didn't join. She was on the fringe. But Mr. Garvey was big in his representation of the struggle of our people. And so, uh, when I heard a word that I felt could stimulate consciousness in our people and cause our people to reject the position of a free slave and arise to really become an independent nation, I was willing to give up my music to pursue that. So one day I was playing uh, this uh, organa. We played it at Boston Symphony Hall. We did it at Carnegie Hall. We did it, did it at the Civic Center in Philadelphia. And we were at the Tivoli Theater in Chicago. But the last time I did it was at the Dunbar High School in Chicago. And little did I know, there were two shows that day and Mr. Muhammad came out to the last show. I didn't know he was there. So I was singing this song, Look at My Chains, and I played my violin and, and then put the white man on trial and kind of gave him a good whipping. Uh -huh. And the judge sentenced him to death. And I was very happy that <laughs> that was an honest judge. Uh -huh. I wish we had more like that more today. More honest judges. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he sent for me, and when I went to his home, he, um, he told me that he did not want me to play music anymore. He said, I want you to concentrate on the spiritual. 
He said, even though you are very good in what you do musically, your greatest talent is in the spiritual. Would you give this up and concentrate on the spiritual? And I said, yes, sir. So going back now to 74, don't you know something new? So he put me back in my music. Uh -huh. We have an album now that um, uh, Brother um, Kenny Gamble. Uh -huh. of Gamble and Huff. Gamble and Huff. Philadelphia. Yes, yeah. he's the yeah. co-producer uh -huh. because he heard my arrangement of the Beethoven Violin Concerto. And from 2002, I began working on this album. Uh -huh. And we just finished it. 13 years, 13 years later. later. Stevie Wonder is on the album, Shaka Khan, Denise Williams, um, Kirk Whalem, uh, Damon Molly, uh, mm -hmm. Snoop Dogg, uh, Rick Ross. Uh, <laughs> oh man, we just having a time. You got Rick Ross on your album? Oh yeah. It sounds like a rap album, it sounds like a... Well, you know what? <laughs> it, it's not a rap album, uh -huh. but Snoop, <clears throat> he played a major part because we talked to Snoop and we told Snoop uh, in our little talk that young people are being misused all over the world by powerful governments that will take the lives of young people who love their nation or love their country and make them think that they're doing good, but sending them to war on the basis of a lie, all because they want the resources of a nation that they could not get to unless they made the leader of that nation a demon and demonized them, then made the American soldier hate that person and then send them to war. And so it was with... Um, Is that how you felt about uh, Libya, when we went into Libya? Yes. Mm -hmm. I was very displeased uh, with Hillary Clinton and President Bush, I mean um, President Barack, mm -hmm. because in Africa, Muammar Gaddafi was the most stabilizing force on the African continent. He is a man that built his country with some of the, I mean, great industries that he put there, had uh, billions of dollars spent in the desert to go down and find water under the desert and brought that water up and the whole coastline of Libya became green because of water and then agriculture. And uh, he had, oh, I don't know how many tons of gold that he had. He was debt free, owed nobody, nothing. And for Barack or, or Hillary or America or England or France to say that he had to go and for Barack to tell him he should step down when the man built a country and this country is damn near $60 trillion in debt and you want to tell a man that's doing something that he should step down for what? And then to have him uh, deposed and killed? No, I didn't like that mm -hmm. at all. Barack is my brother, I love him. But you know, when you vote for a man for president, you think he's the power, mm -hmm. but he's not the power. Mm -hmm. The powers are those who drive the presidents and that's the shadow government that I've talked about in my 58 uh, week uh, sermon on the time and what must be done. There's so much I wanna say, brother, but yeah. I'll just leave it like that I, I'm back in the music, but music has not softened me. I don't want nobody to think that he, the minister gonna play some music and forget about the suffering of my people. But have you heard of DJ Rogers? DJ Rogers, where's he from? 
He, well, I, I don't know exactly where he's from, but he's in California. Uh -huh. And he was very, very popular as a musician, and he's a preacher now. And I was playing my violin uh, at the farm with my teacher at that time, uh, Mr. Charles Veal, and he brought DJ Rogers to the farm. And when I started playing the violin, we, I was rehearsing for a program that would be played in Detroit. DJ stopped me and said, Minister, I got to tell you something. Even if you throw me out of your house, I said, brother, I, I wouldn't throw you out of my house for telling me whatever's on your mind. So he looked at me and he said, brother, God has given you a weapon and you are not using it. And then he reminded me of David. He said, David was a musician. David was a warrior. David was a prophet. David was a king. And I said, oh, wow. Because the first time I was in the presence, the physical presence of Elijah Muhammad, I had dinner at his home. And after dinner, he came around to all the guests. It's the first and only time I saw him do it. And he shook their hands. And when he got to me, he shook my hand and pulled me close and said, brother, you remind me of David. And then he went on. I was a very new Muslim. I didn't know that he knew that one day I would sit in his seat like uh, he was a king mm -hmm. after Saul. And uh, he then, before he left, sat me in his seat in front of the congregation. And so I've had a, a great uh, life so far. Yeah. But I don't want you to think that I came down from heaven. Mm -hmm. I rose up from hell just like all of us. And I want to ask you about that because, you know, you, you have a, a way of being very re relatable to um, some of the most edgiest artists we have coming out of hip hop, whether it's a Chief Keef <coughs> or it's a Lil Durk or a uh, King Louie, you know, some of these guys who've been in your presence and, you know, out of your presence, these guys are at e each other's neck. But in your presence, you see these guys come together and, and squash beefs and, and exist in love. You know, and normally when that happens, it's because it's something you sense or feel about the person that, that's the mediator. In your life, growing up as a teenager, did you face a lot of tribulations and trials that are temptations, you know, did, like these guys have? What, what, what were some of those things you had to face to keep you on the right path? Like, did you ever commit a crime? Oh, no. You never committed a crime? Well, wait, 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 I'm not gonna lie. I, okay. did, I did do something. What was that? Oh, it was so small. <laughs> I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And a dear friend of mine had a beautiful pearl handle knife. And when he showed me the knife, I liked the knife so much that I took the knife and put it in my pocket. And the next day, he started asking, they called me Gene at that time. Gene, did you see my knife? I said, no, I didn't see no knife. And I went back to my house, I'm 10 years old. But stealing and lying beat me so bad till I never let that act that I did escaped my consciousness. Uh. And just, I think it was maybe a month ago, his brother, the brother of the brother who I stole his knife, we found each other in Washington, D.C. Oh no, Atlanta, uh -huh. in Atlanta. 
And I confessed to him that uh, <laughs> I had stole <laughs> his brother's knife. And he looked at me. I was telling the Muslims about it because there's something about lying and stealing that will lead you to greater crimes. And my mother would beat the hell out of me over the lie. Uh -huh. She would beat me if I stole, and she knew about it, but beat me worse for lying. So I've had that kind of conscience since I was 10 years old. So I'm not, I never got into no real crime, but to me, that was a crime against my conscience. Uh -huh. So when I said to the brother, I said, yeah, man, that's been on my mind. And when I saw that you had, had called and, and, and wanted to see me, the first thing that popped up in my mind was that knife that I stole from his brother. I said, yeah, I want to see him. Mm -hmm. So after I told him that I had stolen his brother's knife, he said, well, don't feel bad, Gene, because I got a confession to make. You used to have a lot of milk in front of your door. You know, in those days, they, they would put the milk in a carriage and put it in front of the door. He said, I was so hungry, I stole your milk. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's uh, as far as I went. That's as far as you go? Okay. But, you know, I did smoke some reefer. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't expect to hear that. <laughs> well, no, was see. It, was it purple? Was it cookies? No. <laughs> <laughs> see, but when I did it, Reefer was 50 cents for one reefer. Uh -huh. And I was in show business then, and naturally I wanted to try what other uh, musicians were trying, so I smoked reefer, smoked hash, uh -huh. and then did some pills, you know. But you know what? You did pills? Yeah. Oh. I knew from that that wasn't for me, because I never wanted to lose control mm -hmm. of who I am, where I am. So I decided none of that would be in my life. Now, when I went to hear Elijah Muhammad, I had a reefer in my hat band. <laughs> and they search you, you know, but they didn't search my hat band. So I got away <laughs> with a reefer in the mosque. but. When I got converted, I had to make up my mind, but I smoked that one that night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, just for the record, I don't have no, no reefer in my hat right now, so I just wanna, <laughs> I just wanna make that clear to you, sir. All right, uh, well, that, that's good to know because, you know, I think for a lot of us, I, I've always seen you on TV or on the screen, or I, I've even heard you like audio recordings of you, and I, I've always been curious to uh, what, what brought a man to this path, you know. And all of us are with flaws; none of us are perfect. I've heard you say that, you know. And so I think that's part of what what makes you so relatable um, to this hip hop community. And when you're talking about someone like Snoop, who's a, is a good friend of mine, and we. We pretty much know his history, and I just think it's amazing how you bring the best out of um, out of this culture. People who come from this culture, you know, and this culture is what has influenced us the most um, this generation in, in the past 30, 30 or forty years. What was that that influenced you the most? Was it the word? Yes, okay. it was the word, but it's also when you know yourself and you know that you are not perfect, it would be the height of hypocrisy for me as a spiritual teacher to look down on my brother or sister because of some fault that they had. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that we are the direct descendants of the Creator and we are a part of the Creator's nation. So we are the righteous 
by nature, but wicked by circumstance. Mm. So when you grow up under a devil, and he's your foster father, then you can't claim to be holy. None of us have grown up under righteousness. Though the Bible says we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We've come up under the most murderous people on our planet. We are the victims of kidnapping from Africa, rape, robbery, murder. Then to think that they took away from us our name, our language, our culture, our history, our religion, our God, and turned us inside out. So no matter how black you are, you a white man on the inside. What do I mean by that? Look at your actions. If you can rob each other and don't feel nothing, and you can kill one another and don't feel nothing, then your humanity has been taken from us by a wicked deceiver. It's not your sin, it's the sin of your enemy imposed on you. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that his teacher, Master Farad Muhammad said, that we are other than ourselves. I mean, he was so sweet the way he said it, you are other than yourself. But what is yourself that you are other than? He said, yourself is a righteous person by nature. But now we are not that. So born in sin, what does that mean? Sex is not sin. It's divinely ordained. Otherwise, procreation would not have produced human beings for billions and trillions of years on our planet. It's the misuse of sex that is sin. So sin, according to scripture, is transgression of the law and being shaped in iniquity is because we had an iniquitous teacher who shaped us. So you got 10 commandments, what thou shalt not do, everything that God said thou shalt not do, the enemy says okay. Uh -huh. But then when you do it, you in prison. He's the biggest thief. You out here stealing little stuff. He steals countries. You can't compete with them. You kill a few. He's culling the earth of two to three billion people as a policy of the United States government. What can our little murder in the hood do to compete with a man who's killing people all over the earth? So much so that the big new Brzezinski, the former um, I think he was the national security yes. advisor yes. under, was it Clinton? Carter. 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 He said there was a time when it was easier to control a million people than to kill a million people. But with the awakening of people all over the world because of a man called Steve Jobs and a man like Gates who gave us this tremendous thing called the iPhone and the iPad. You are in touch instantaneously with people all over the world. You can tap into libraries all over the world. There's nothing of knowledge that's not at our fingertips because of what that man did. So the media conglomerates are losing power over the masses that they've always controlled. Now who cares? Because the young people are not looking at no TV. Uh -huh. They hardly look at, uh, uh, ra listen to radio. They, everybody's head is bent at a 45 degree angle. Yeah, on the phone. On the phone. Yeah. Well, now, 
Zbigniew Brzezinski said, it's easier to kill a million people than it is to control a million people. And I don't know whether you've heard this before, but I'm going to call names uh, because, you know, if you know what you know, then say what you know mm -hmm. and be willing to pay the price because there is a price for telling truth to power and waking up the masses of people who've been put to sleep by this elite that control. Imagine, imagine, every time you get on the phone, they're listening. Imagine every time you send an email, they got it. So if you mad with somebody, well, I, I hate that so-and-so, he did such and such. Oh, really? They got it. Mm -hmm. And if they want to create mischief between you and your party, they'll get in between you, and before you know it, you're fighting each other. Well, imagine that a man has that kind of reach that he can listen into your phone, gather all information about you, so he knows when he uh, uh, sifts you what your weaknesses are and what your strengths are. This man, Elijah Muhammad, called him a universal snooper. So he's always trying to find something negative about you. Mm -hmm. And he'll wait until the right moment and he'll throw it on TV or tell you what you did that you didn't want nobody to know. But his day is here now. We got him. We know his history from the time he was a thought. We know what he was made of, yeah. how he was made, and the nature of him, and we know the way he thinks, and we know who made him like that. So we're in a position now to lock him up because when a liar can't lie no more to deceive you, he's finished. When a trickster can't trick you no more because you know the way he plays his game, then his game is over. Mm -hmm. So the enemy's game is up. White supremacy is finished. Mm -hmm. The black man is rising. Humanity is rising. His day to rule us with tricks and lies is over if we wake up and realize that we've been tricked. As Malcolm said, we've been hoodwinked. Mm -hmm. We've been bamboozled. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. You know, um, when I listen to you speak <clears throat> and, and you talk about uh, white supremacy being on its way out, and I, I look at the nation of Islam and, and how it's expanded its reach, you know, it's, it's not just about the the black man's plight in America anymore, correct? Like, no. It, like anybody can it, join the nation. It's about our plight all over the world. Okay. But in truth, my brother, the nation of Islam was started just for black people. Yeah. And we started like Jesus. When Jesus started teaching, he told his followers, go ye not in the way of the Gentiles or in the way of the Samaritans. Go ye to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Ain't nobody on this earth more lost than the black man and woman of America and the Western Hemisphere and our people in Africa who have lived under colonialism while we have lived under slavery and colonialism in the Caribbean and a neo-colonialism which is to rob you of the power of your mind to keep you like a top spinning. So if we were really awake, we would be unified. You and I are brothers cut from the same cloth. 
we're not only brothers because of color, we're brothers because our origin is God himself. So now the enemy has put us like dry bones in the valley. We're all separated, disconnected. But today is our day to rise. It's our day to come together in unity and power to stop the tyranny of our oppression. Uh, you know, but I want to finish that okay. question because now Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach this gospel to every nation, kindred, and tongue. Well, that's what we're doing now. And October 10, 15, which is the 20th anniversary of the Million Man March, our talk that day will be in French and Spanish and Arabic and Chinese because we're reaching for the whole world because everywhere you look in the world, people are rising against injustice. I hope I get a chance uh, in this uh, broadcast to talk about Henry Kissinger and his uh, memo to government that became a policy. Mm -hmm. Do I have time? You have time. Can we come, can we come, come back, back to it? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, yeah, you have all the time that you allot to me, so it's as much time as you're willing to give me. Thank you, know, you brother. Uh, I want to bring it back domestically because it, just listen to you speaking uh, about how divided we are, you know, and messaging that you're giving to artists like Snoop and Jay Electronica and uh, I'm sure Kanye and, and Jay-Z and, you know, Lil Herb and Louie and Ice Cube and Suge and, you know, all the different people you've spoken to. It's hard, you know, I'm on a radio platform every day, I'm on television, and, and it's hard trying to sneak truth in, you know, and, and get folks to reflect on our reality. It's a challenge, you know. You have artists like Kendrick Lamar who would make a, a, a statement in a song like The Black of the Berry where he says, why would I weep with, with Trayvon Martin is laying in the street when gangbanging has me killing people who are blacker than me? Hypocrite, you know, and that's how his song ends. And then he would receive a lot of backlash if people would say that's respectability politics. Uh, what is your argument to that? I mean, that's one of the things I've said. You can't said. ever argue with truth. Mm -hmm. Then you make yourself a fool. You might not like what he said, but the reality is we march every time a white man kills a black person. They've been doing that ever since we came to these shores. But what hurts is when we can smoke each other over nothing and then go back and feel like we did something good. We've become cold and heartless and naked of moral value when you can put your girls out because now you can't sling the dope like you used to sling it. So now you take these young girls and make them prostitutes. I was in the hood, man, and, and as I go and talk to our brothers who are in certain conditions, certain sisters <clears throat> would come to me and beg me to get them out of the condition that they're in because our brothers have them prostituting themselves. And then one young girl, when I was out in the hood, some of the sisters said, don't you want to go over and, and get his autograph or shake his hand? She said, no, I just want to be his B. To you, about you? Yeah. Okay. She wanted to be a female dog for me, as though that's something glorious. See, this is ignorance on steroids. So our people need to be fixed. Our, the, the problem 
is we can't go to Washington to charge the government and then turn a blind eye to what we are doing to one another. Mm -hmm. And that means, as I've been saying, the war that we are fighting has to be on two fronts. We can't go to Washington and say, you all ain't treating us right, which they're not, and then deny that we're not treating each other right. Mm -hmm. So Rudolph Giuliani, you know, I, I, I didn't like uh, uh, certain words that he said, so, you know, I called him a, well, he, a privilege, you know. He, he said that the president didn't love America. Yes. Yeah, and, and you came to his, the president's defense. Yes because that's the president's problem. He loves America so much that he will not act in a way to correct the wrong that's sending America to hell. What kind of man should I be if I see my country corrupt and rotten, even when he tried to correct the wickedness of George W. Bush when he first became president, they beat him up so bad that he, uh, he was over there uh, 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 apologizing for us. He was trying to tell the world, America has made mistakes. And who will deny that you've been a liar and a thief? Well, he won't say it like I say it. He'll be diplomatic. But I'm too damn old to want to be diplomatic. <laughs> Liars and thieves are what they are. That's what they've done all over the world. He knows it. And for him to be a modern pharaoh. See, when you run for the presidency of the United States, you're running for the position of the CEO of the United States of America, which is the modern Egypt, the modern Rome. So he's the modern pharaoh. So even if he wants to do good, he can't. Look at all the drones he's sending all over the world. And violence can't, can't accomplish anything. The minute we rise up in the hood because of the evil that is perpetrated against us, all they want to know is, is this going to be peaceful? Uh -huh. They got a hell of a nerve asking us, is it going to be peaceful when everything they've gotten all over the world is through violence? through bloodshed, through war. No, these are hypocrites, and I like to call them out. Let me ask you this. I, I know in the, in the case of um, Ferguson, what happened to Ferguson, you, you, you called out to the president and um, Attorney General Eric Holder and said, you have to stop these wicked folks from killing our br black and brown youth, because this won't hold no more. <clears throat> What, what would you, how would you propose that they do it? Through, is it a, a policy or what type of uh, infrastructure could they create to, to, how can they reverse that wickedness? If you were president, what would you, how would you do it? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> I wouldn't want to be president of this. Mm -hmm. This is why God has come to take this out. This is an evil world that we are living in. This is not the world that Jesus was calling us toward. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. And in the book of James, it said, the love of this world is enmity or hatred with God. Then Jesus said, you can't love or serve two masters. You gotta love one and hate the other. Hate is not bad if you hate what God hates, but the sad thing is if you hate what God loves. And Jesus was hated without a cause. That's why it's difficult for people to walk with Farrakhan. They say, yeah, I like him, I like him a lot, but bring him around the back door at midnight uh, because I might lose my job if I associate with Farrakhan. I don't have AIDS. I'm not a diseased man, but what I do have is knowledge, truth, 
that will make you stand up like a man and like a woman. And as long as you lay down, do you have children, brother? I have a 16-year-old daughter. May God bless you and bless her. Thank you. What kind of world is she growing up in? What kind of man would you want to marry your daughter when you come out of the streets, you don't have no desire to do nothing but hustle women who are making money. What kind of man will our young girls have when they are in college and our brothers are in the street? See, this is social engineering now mm -hmm. that's being done by those in high places. And that's why Paul said, we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. This is what is going on now. Little white people are not doing the things to us that cause us to be in the condition. This comes from way up. Mm -hmm. Can I give you an example? Please do. When I was a little boy, Growing up in Boston, Massachusetts, there were factories in the inner cities all over America where unskilled labor could have a job in a factory. I don't care what kind of money they made, they brought that home and they could take care of their wives and their children. And every morning I would see a black man leaving his home with his lunch pail going to work. Forty years ago I was overseas and when I came back I read in the paper that the social scientists and others were saying there's no need to invest in the inner cities because the inner cities are about to explode. So instead of people bringing money into the inner cities, the money was taken out, the factories closed, and unskilled labor had no job. So if we were not entrepreneurial to set up something that we could do to earn a dollar to feed our family, now the social engineering starts taking place. You break down the family because after that, the mothers that were on welfare, fathers, she had to lie and say there was no man living in the house so she could collect her check while the man had no job. And so she was on welfare or she went to school and got a job. Black women can get jobs today where a black man can't get a job. Mm -hmm. You could be very talented, very brilliant, just come out of Harvard or Howard, and you can't get a job, but your woman got the job. So when your woman got more money than you, her voice is not female a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Because now you can't pay the bills because you got no money. So when you don't have any money that a man should have to feed his family and take care of his children, then the woman becomes the breadwinner and you live in there not making no bread. So what are you good for? They don't need you for sex. They buy machines for that. Mm. Or you turn out on the down low. Because the woman is so strong, she make you look like a punk before you become one. Mm. Excuse me, but that's real. <laughs> that's real. Yeah. Social engineering. Then here comes Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan wants to fight the communists in Central America. He comes to Congress. Congress won't give him the money. He goes to King Fahd of Arabia, he gives him 10 million. That's not enough. So enter the CIA and the drug trade. Drugs coming from Central and South America 
into California where crack cocaine now becomes the craze. In the meantime, back in Washington, while we were having the Million Man March 20 years ago, they were in Congress setting the limits on powdered cocaine as opposed to crack cocaine. So now they snatch our brothers and sisters up. We in jail with a felony. Now check how these enemies have worked us. We go into prison, then we got a job in prison. Some of us working for IBM, some of us working for Motorola, some of us working for these high tech uh, places, learning how to do things in prison, but when you get out, you're a felon now, you can't even use what you learned in prison, so you end right back up in prison, and the 13th Amendment is in full force. Once you are a criminal, you become a slave again. That's what this thing is all about. So now the drugs are in the community. Rick Ross, bless his heart, he said, I, you know, I didn't know that I was working for the government, that the government was the one supplying me with the drugs. He said, I was making a million dollars a day. Well, wouldn't that make you feel pretty good if you were making a million dollars a day? Frank Lucas. He was on the, the heroin tip, yeah. and he was bringing in what? Pure heroin. How many people were dying? The moment you and I start becoming conscious, in the 60s, Frank Lucas was bringing in heroin. In the 80s, Rick Ross bringing in crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. And now the gang warfare the Crips, the Bloods, then it spreads from the West Coast to the East Coast. And who's filling the jails? It's you and me. It's Sway in the Morning, only on Shea 45.